Thanks, Drew. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. It's good to see you all in. Um, so this is the, the title of the meetup uh, at the moment. This is the DEMA SA Data Management Monthly User Group Meeting. Um, and just to remind everybody, it's the, every third Wednesday of the month, um, 16 to 1700 recordings will be made. We do share uh, notifications on the meetup for registered people. So you'll get, a, you'll get a notice just saying recording is available. I do share it on LinkedIn, but I also know that you don't always see the posts on LinkedIn. Um, they can come and go. But so if you have registered on Meetup, which I believe you have, then you'll pick up the, the recordings. We do try to get the deck. Uh, Ernest, if, if you wouldn't mind sending me your deck, if that's OK, um, then I'll post it. So the monthly user group meetings, there's ins and outs of data modeling. Um, big data science, data privacy, and data governance and ethics. So these are the timeframes, but I would also like to also introduce you to Christian Carl. He's on the, he's on the, on the session today. He runs a really exciting meetup group, and uh, there's almost four or five sessions planned to do with um, Data Vault, and I, I'm not, I think there was one on anchor modeling, but I haven't seen that. So uh, Christian, quick quick word from you, if you'd like to share about your, your group. Yeah, I'm organizing the data modeling meetup Munich, but similar to, to yours, we're open to everybody now, now because we're, we're online and we have scheduled two more data world meetups this year, one in German on the 24th of November and one in English on the 7th of December. I can share a link in the chat. That, that would be fantastic. So yeah, Christian's doing a great job. So guys, if you want to support him, there's some amazing talks on that so that's really good then we've got the big data and data science um and that's the third monday of every month so we've just had one uh, that was uh, on monday and on the ai economy um and that was really good by kahiso malema from mtn and he was talking on the ai economy and again um if you guys would like the recordings give me a shot um and i'll i'll make them available. Okay, now those hosts are Mishima from MTN, Drew and myself, uh, but typically led by Mishima and Drew. And then we've got data privacy. I don't know if you guys, um, the last chat was on the Experian data breach. Anybody attend, if you guys attend there? And that's on the second, of, second Wednesday of every month, okay? So it's also between 16 and 1700. That's led by Caroline and supported by myself. And then we have data governance and ethics that um, we've got to do some catch up on. Um, so you'll see the, the, the group that's just started, that's big data and data science. We had the AI economy and then we had AB testing. Um, and we had a nice uh, upfront discussion from Mishima on ethics as well. So there's really, really exciting stuff. In terms of upcoming events, that's the one that um, we're having now. And then guys, just to note that every Friday, Veronica hosts a CDMP Q&A. Um, these are free and she takes you through uh, just preparing for the CDMP exam, helping you understand the, the, the way to write and the exams and stuff like that. So that's been, we've had quite a few attendees on that at least. I think Veronica, maybe uh, average of about, six to eight people a week that are that are interested in writing the cdmp um so yes they are yeah. okay it's because okay. Pe people are it, it's a daunting thing and and yeah. i just take them through how we go about it how to register try and take the fear out of it yeah um, yeah so so just for logan yogan that was especially for you um all right Okay, so past events. So we had a really nice one on data protection. That's on the Experian. We've got the, Q, the CDMP Q&A, ins and outs of data modelings, and then there's the data management for certification. Okay, so just as a notice before we uh, switch to Ernest, we're always looking for presenters uh, all, on all the meetups. So guys, if you'd like to chat, I know Henry and them are doing some good work on digital decisioning. So uh henry's probably surprised by that so <laughs> henry if you'd like to share anybody know about digital decisioning 
So there's some there's some nice work happening there. And then co-hosts for any of the new knowledge areas. So you will notice that we we've actually built these data meetups for specific areas, and we're trying to build them around somebody's passion. So, for example, Caroline Mouton, she's uh, very passionate about data privacy, and and so we'll have a meeting that she leads, and certainly we'll support. Drew and I support, and Paul. Um, but anyone, any master data, anything that you guys feel you'd like to have a, a sort of group discussion, we've got almost 1,400 1, members at the moment, uh, just short of that. So helpful to just to be able to share and, and, and chat with the people. Um, we also got a, a development that's happening, which is what we refer to as the data privacy conceptual and logical data model. That's um, working, we're starting with the GDPR data protection ontology, okay? And we then customizing that for Papaya, and we'd like to build um, ba basically a data mart to be able to report when you have a regulation failure or when the regulator requests. So that's, that's the start. And we've got some, quite a few people interested on that. And then we're also going to be starting up uh, a series of data management chat. And we basically, it's similar to George uh, McCreeshi that has those chin wags. We're doing a similar thing in terms of data management. And basically you ask us to talk, I'll prepare, and then we discuss. Um, and we'll have them once a week, four weeks, um, uh, four weeks a month. And we'll be making those announcements. Anyone who wants to join that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, any questions before we hand over to Ernest? Sorry to get in the way. No questions. Okay, Ernest, all yours. Uh, Craig, Thank you very much. Craig was going to do the intro first for Ernest. Ah, okay, Craig, all yours. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Howard and Drew. So, um, yeah, I've I've got the privilege of of working with Ernest. Uh, Ernest um, is the uh, master data management specialist and solutions architect at uh, MediClinic International, where uh, I'm consulting. And uh, yeah, Ernest has uh, been in the IT industry for more than 25 years, and um, yeah, has been involved in manufacturing, finance, and uh, in the medical industries. Uh, with experience in data modeling and design, data protection and security, data integration, uh, reference and master data management, and then warehousing and data quality. So he's sort of playing all over the, the demo wheel. Um, and uh, yeah, Ernest has really been instrumental in helping us bed down um, some of the agile scrum framework at MediClinic over the past two years. So um, yeah, as part of his team, I've definitely seen the benefits of this. And um, yeah, it's really has helped us as a team to uh, be more productive, be able to deliver, um, yeah, just better to business because we're understanding our own capabilities and, and business is able to yeah, be, get more realistic timelines from us uh, in terms of our deliveries. So uh, I think enough of me. I'm going to hand over to Ernest. Ernest, thanks again for being willing to present. And um, yeah, we look forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thank you very much, Craig. And thank you very much, everybody, for this invitation. Um, I hope uh, uh, you will learn something from what we're going to do uh, talk about today. For those of you that are new to Agile, don't worry, I will um, talk a bit about the Agile principles and about the Agile Scrum uh, process and framework. So uh, uh, if you have any questions, uh, what I'll do is as I go through the actual presentations, I will actually um, just uh, stop and give you the chance to actually see uh, what um, or ask questions whenever you need to. Just trying to share the screen here. I don't know what's going on. We've got uh, your okay. outlook. Okay. All right, that's good. Okay. Uh, all right. 
So effectively, um, first of all, let me just start by giving you a bit of an overview in terms of MediClinic as a company and also about our uh, data management team within MediClinic. MediClinic as a company started, was established in 1983 and is currently listed on the London, London Stock Exchange. We consist of uh, three divisions, uh, here's London in Switzerland, uh, MediClinic uh, uh, Middle East in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and then of course MediClinic Southern Africa in South Africa and Namibia. Uh, we also have a 29.9% share in the Spire Healthcare Group in the UK. Uh, in South Africa, we also uh, consist of uh, MHR, which is a temporary healthcare um, uh, placement group that uh, provides resources to uh, 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 private healthcare facilities, uh, as well as ER24, which forms part of our as a group. As a data management function, uh, we provide services not only to the, uh, the group, but to also uh, the individual divisions. So therefore, as you will see when I go to the next slide, you will see that uh, we've uh, been developing uh, solutions uh, since 2013 uh, in the data management space, but we play actually uh, on both sides, we deliver, deliver solutions for master data management as well as bespoke data management solutions. In terms of master data management solutions, uh, you will see that, uh, for instance, we have the, uh, the management reporting structure solution that we have there that, uh, that was developed one of, as one of our first solutions. And uh, it's also the GL account one that was developed as one of our first solutions. But uh, effectively, those solutions now are becoming uh, very pivotal to every, all of our, to the rest of our um, solutions that we are delivering. We are seeing more and more a handshake between the different solutions, especially now that we're also starting with an identity and access management solution uh, mastering for uh, the group. On the bespoke data management solutions, um, these are more, uh, solutions that actually addresses specific business requirements. Um, one of these that I can highlight maybe is the infection, infection prevention and control solution, which played a major part uh, at the start of COVID when we had to identify patients uh, that was um, uh, COVID positive and therefore had to have a track, track record of that. And the solution we could implement within a few, a few weeks uh, and what it was up and running and the, the business could use it. Another uh, interesting solution that we are using, that we've developed is the, the in, uh, environmental sustainability solution. Uh, this solution is used to capture um, facility consumption in terms of water, electricity, waste, um, gases, uh, fuel, and uh, everything that impacts our sustainability. Uh, this information is rolled up and then used in our company-wide uh, sustainability reporting on a yearly basis. Now, in total, we've got 23 solutions that we currently support. There are some more that we are currently busy building. And uh, in order to maintain all of this, we only have a team of three developers and myself as the lead um, in terms of the team. We use EBX5 as, the, uh, as our technology to deliver this, the solutions. Uh, EBX5 uh, allows us the flexibility to um, you know, develop uh, bespoke solutions quite easily within the solution. We use JIRA as our delivery, delivery management solution in order to manage uh, the delivery in terms of the Agile framework and then we have Sherwell as the incident and uh, uh, re service request management solution that we have implemented. Are there any questions from anybody on the call? I guess I can continue. So as I said earlier, uh, we develop or deliver solutions for the entire group as well as divisions. But effectively, we also have certain data management challenges. And I think um, most of these challenges also speaks to, to some of the challenges that or the challenges that you are facing in your individual uh, business areas. 
quite recently, recently data as, a, as an asset was added as one of our strategic objectives, which means that we need to deliver data, quality data uh, for the management reporting, as well as our um, predictive anal analytics uh, um, using machine learning and AI. So the emphasis on data is increasing and it's not something in the, the dark, dark corner anymore in the company. It's getting a, a, a bigger um, focus and uh, really we need to, to, to step up in order to deliver according to the business business. Um, expectations. Like uh, all other businesses, uh, we are fast moving, but also the, in, in terms of the requirements of the business is changing ever faster. We've realized that uh, the traditional delivery mechanisms in terms of the waterfall model um, methodology actually didn't help us very much, and we were slowly falling behind. And we had to make a step change, and Agile and the Scrum Agile um, framework actually gave us that step step change that we could do. Our business uh, is also quite very competitive um, and it basically now demands that we actually obtain data from IoT devices and non-standard or non, uh, uh, yes, non-standard data sources. So effectively we need to be, be able to adjust and obtain the data and be able to um, service the business in, in ways that we haven't done before. Uh, the impact of COVID, uh, if, if you think about it, have impacted everybody. And unfortunately, it also in, impacted us because uh, you may not know, but uh, during the lockdown per period, we were restricted not to, to do uh, elective su surgery within our hospitals. So therefore the impact in terms of our revenue um, has really uh, impacted us much like it has impacted everybody else. The fact of the matter is that that just increases the, the, the impact on us and uh, the expectation on, on us to be much more cost effective. Um, and therefore to deliver solutions efficiently and uh, quite fast without having uh, the expenses that we had before. Um, Yes, I think in terms of uh, regulatory pres pressures, uh, as you can see, we're not only subject to, to Papia, we're also subjected to GDPR because we operate in Europe. But quite recently, um, even the Middle East came up with uh, their own uh, security, uh, data security and privacy uh, information act, uh, which is quite extensive and it's got speci special implications in terms of healthcare and restrictions. And all of this impacts the way that we can access data, process data, and um, engage with our different divisions. So whenever do we deliver solutions to them, we always have to take uh, data privacy into consideration in terms of doing anything. Uh, due to the front line pressures in terms of business, uh, and I think uh, many of you will feel the same, is that business, uh, in the end, as uh, their day job is not to do IT, their day job is to fulfill the uh, the task that is at hand, um, and therefore we always uh, get the, the 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 pushback from business in terms of when whenever we want them to be involved in our IT processes, in terms of our delivery and everything, and we get that pushback back saying, "I don't have the time for this. You need to uh, to to accommodate me." And uh, we've, we've realized that as a, as a delivery arm, we need to step up from our side, even though we understand that the business is very busy. Um, it doesn't help us just sitting back and complaining that uh, we don't get FaceTime with, with our stakeholders and uh, we don't get enough opportunity to, to talk to them. Um, we need to do something from our side. And with the uh, uh, approach to, to Agile and the framework with Agile, it actually gave us that opportunity to change the way that we engaged with them. And um, it improved so, it's, uh, um, so many uh, things for us in terms of our relationship with our stakeholders. 
And then, of course, from a technology perspective, uh, the expectation from business these days is that whenever you deliver a solution, it must be easy to use, it must be intuitive, and it must have the functionality that they can have on their mobile phones. So effectively, having that balance in terms of the expectations versus all the constraints that you are working in, you cannot do it any other way anymore, but through agile delivery uh, mechanisms. Any questions? Nothing. Okay. Quite silence. All right. Uh, well, Anna, mm -hmm. Aaron Star, it's Henry. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to check um, from a, a foundational perspective, was there any work that you guys had to do to create a platform that you can use to exploit uh, to become more agile? So, yes, uh, in, in effectively, when we started the journey, we were, were not um, uh, implementing uh, through an agile um, approach. We basically were following a, a, a pseudo uh, waterfall approach. So effectively, uh, you will see now when I go to the next slide, I will talk a bit more in terms of the adoption, what we had to do in terms of adopting Agile and uh, what uh, we needed to put in place, if, if, if that's fine with you. Thank you. Okay. Ernest, can I also mm -hmm. just ask a question? In sure. terms of your Agile versus Waterfall, is this more in terms of from a production support and ongoing support of the business or was this from a, you're developing new systems and and you found that agile is more effective than waterfall so it's, it's actually yeah. for both so okay. you will see that uh, we implemented agile for both the um, the new delivery of solutions as well as the operational support of of uh, solutions that's already in production so okay. I will also talk about that a bit later in, in the presentation, if that's fine with you. Cool, thank you. Ernst, Ernst, mm -hmm. is it possible? Just one question with respect to your, before you go into Agile, just with respect to your data management challenges, MediClinic having an international footprint, how did you reconcile standards that are used, for example, in diagnosis in South Africa, the ICD-10 standard versus those mm -hmm. that your international um, portions of your business would need it to, needed to use SNOMED, et cetera. How did you manage the difference then? Then how do you leverage that as a, as a single standard within your group? So effectively at this stage, we, we still have different standards in the different um, divisions. The reason being that for instance, in South Africa, um, there are different uh, amendments to the standards, uh, the ICD-10 standard. So effectively, we cannot uh, bring them all together. But what we we, we are do, um, going to develop in the future is to basically create a uh, solution that will basically master it to one code. So that will be quite an exercise. Um, we do have some mapping already for some of the different uh, code structures. But effectively, and unfortunately, that is currently being maintained in an access database. And I'm sorry to say that, but uh, effectively, we will move forward uh, in the future to bring that into EBX. Thanks very much. Okay. All right. In terms of agile adoption, um, we started uh, 2018, about June, July. Uh, on our Agile journey. Um, at that stage, uh, I was uh, fortunately um, invited by Ultron and Greg and Paul in to, to attend a Agile training session. Um, and I know that uh, Greg at that stage, I think he already did the training session. So he was quite, quite versed already in, in terms of Agile. But effectively we, we're delivering solutions, but uh, you know something was not quite right because I couldn't, I didn't have uh, have the feeling that I quite had the, my finger on the pulse in terms of delivering the solutions as well as the support that we are we're providing in terms of our operational support. Um, and I must say, the first day of training was very much focused in terms of the. Uh, waterfall versus uh, agile um, uh, framework. 
the pros and cons of both. And uh, at that stage, I was very much a supporter of Waterfall, and it was quite interesting how it's, it's you know, inside yourself when you really believe in something and somebody starts shaking those foundations, you can start realizing that these are the things that were really bothering you about Waterfall all the, the time. So uh, effectively, that really triggered uh, not only, I think, in myself, but I think in Craig, and also in, my, in the management uh, within Vedic Clinic, some type of thinking that, you know, some change is needed. We, we, we were just not um, up to scratch in terms of what we had to deliver. So effectively, the next step was, all right, if we want to really adopt Agile within our department, we had to actually ensure that everybody within the department gets trained in terms of Agile and the Agile framework. Unfortunately, at that stage, uh, and I think it's still the, the case, the, the training was quite expensive. Um, and uh, after you know, discussing it with uh, Ultron, I got the, the approval from their side to actually utilize uh, some of their training uh, material. And we de developed an in-house training solution and provided the tra training in-house to all of the teams in terms of Agile and the Agile framework. Uh, it actually worked quite well uh, to a certain extent. Uh, unfortunately, you know, not all the teams at that point in time were really bought into uh, the Agile uh, framework and did not really buy into it at that stage. Uh, so effectively, we had to forge ahead. And as a, a data management team, we did forge ahead. And we did implement uh, the, the, the JIRA, um, the, the Agile Scrum uh, framework in, in, our, in our team. But uh, therefore, we had to select a, a platform that we could use to actually manage our Agile delivery. And we, we ended up selecting JIRA. Uh, but quickly after selecting JIRA, we realized that you know, JIRA is talking about epics and events and stories and uh, epics and stories and uh, tasks and bugs and um, components and we had to actually de decide how are we going to use this tool and it took a bit of time you know researching the tool understanding the tool especially the first month of uh, going through a through our first sprint and unfortunately we we decided on a month sprint the first time around but it taught us some lessons. And the first lesson was that, you know, there's just too much happening, especially in a development and operational support environment uh, to, to support, uh, to, to, to have a month long sprint. So therefore, uh, you know, in terms of the JIRA implementation, we did go through a learning curve. Uh, I think we are at a stage now where we, we are quite settled in terms of what we, we want to do with JIRA and how we want to use it. And also what we've done is as we uh, progress through time, the, the training documentation that we initially created actually were amended in order to incorporate the JIRA functionality into that training so that when you are providing the agile training, you're also providing the JIRA training at the same time. And that helped quite a lot, especially for new teams adopting uh, the, the Agile approach. Uh, also, one thing that we had to do is to understand how we're going to do development, uh, uh, new development, as well as operational support in an Agile fr framework. Um, one of the challenges was that because we already had Shirwell and Shirwell was uh, quite recently implemented, there was this uh, tension in the company in terms of, are you now implementing JIRA as a competition to, to, to Sherwell or what is this? Uh, but we quickly realized that, you know, Sherwell in the end just is a pipeline to, for us in terms of either incidents coming in or service requests coming in. And even if you want to, you can have changes coming in through, through RFCs. So effectively to, to ensure that we utilize that as a pipeline because already it was communicated to the entire company's user, user base that 
all incidents and service requests must be logged uh, through the help desk. We could not uh, you know, now come with JIRA as a se separate solution, and we therefore developed an integration between Sherwell and JIRA that allowed us to, to actually then, when an incident is logged in Sherwell, to actually push that through to JIRA as a, as a, as a bug, which then allows us then to, to put it into our sprints and work with it. Also, we took a first stab at that point in time to say, okay, you know, how much of the time do we need to devote to operational support versus um, the actual development of new functionality or changes? Uh, at that stage, we decided, you know, let's take a stab of only, um, only planning 80% of uh, uh, any resources uh, uh, time in terms of new development or changes, and then allow them 20% of their time for support. In fact, uh, a few months later, I think it was about six months later, when I pulled some statistics from uh, JIRA in terms of how much time we actually uh, expended on su support versus uh, new requirements, we've, we found that, you know, in terms of uh, the 80-20 the mix, it was actually quite accurate. So yeah, that was uh, quite interesting uh, for us. But you know, having the tool and having the, 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 the agile process and having the training, I think it's very much like any other uh, data, uh, data management process. There needs to be some drive in terms of the op adoption of it. Uh, and I think the drive and the, 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 of the adoption of the uh, for, of agile is mainly the, the the focus of the scrum master. If the scrum master doesn't have the passion and commitment in terms of the drive, then effectively the team will never adopt uh, agile, and they will always be pushed back. And I think that's that's what was key for us is that on the one side, I, I think uh, Craig uh, and uh, some of the other resources already had the training, so they knew what Agile was about, and they was were qu quite willing to to adopt it. From my side, I had the training, so effectively it was quite easy to to get the entire team to adopt it. Uh, but when it came to other teams, uh, we realized that we had to provide some coaching to the Scrum Masters and coaching to the other de developers in terms of not only the Agile methodology, but also in terms of understanding, you know, what is a story, how to estimate what granularity these stories must be defined at, at in order to make it a viable um, solution to actually or uh, approach to follow. Uh, I think lastly, uh, what I would like to highlight is in terms of the product owners. Um, a product owner play, plays a pivotal role in terms of the entire Agile uh, framework. Unfortunately, you know, in MediClinic, we do not have business analysts uh, and also our business stakeholders, uh, you know, like I said earlier, they have a day job and basically we need, we need to in, ensure that we use optimal, uh, make optimal use of their time. We cannot expect them to participate in all the, the, the events uh, as requested or required by Agile framework. So therefore we realized that we had to step, step up. And one of the solutions that we came up with was uh, that the Scrum Master then also act as product owner. I know that is totally against agile principles, which is totally fine with me, but effectively it helped us because effectively um, the, the business sp spoke to uh, uh, say, for instance, me, uh, I understood the, the requirement, and basically uh, the engagement was always through one person and it didn't go, have to go through multiple people. It helped us quite a lot because uh, over time, the business got more and more on board uh, through the fact that we were using the Agile approach. Okay, so this is just in terms of the adoption. Uh, any questions? Ernest, there's a question in the chat um, from mm -hmm. Carl. He wants to know, um, just wants to confirm, so Sherwell 
um, is feeding the Jira backlog? Yes. Um, in terms of incidents, as well as service requests, as uh, and also we can put in uh, requests for changes. Uh, but normally with uh, incidents and service requests, what we try to do is because an incident requires immediate attention, uh, and sometimes the same with a service request, what we uh, do is we actually uh, talk to, to the development team and understand whether we can add it to the sprint and therefore add it to the, it to the sprint. Because we only planned 80% of the resource utilization, in the sprint, we can then add the additional uh, support that is needed into the sprint. Of course, sometimes uh, there could be a service request that comes in through Sherwell that we clearly uh, understand, but there is no capacity in the team currently to actually deliver on it. And then we will have a discussion with the, the business in order to en en ensure that we agree uh, in terms of you know whether it will be delivered in the following sprint or whether um, the you know what the urgency of that request is. If the request is very urgent, um, then of course uh, we need to have a discussion again with business to say, all right, if you want to bring this into the sprint, then something must go out of the sprint. And I think uh, over time the business really caught on to that. It is all about the communication. It's all about the engagement with business, which is very important. Thanks, Ernest. Okay. All right. I'm going to just quickly run through the Agile framework. Um, and maybe for some of you, this might be new. So for some of you, it might be quite old uh, news, but uh, let me just quickly go through this. Uh, in terms of the Agile framework, uh, you will see that there are different roles. Um, you've got the product owner. The product owner represents the business and basically uh, has got the engagement with all the business stakeholders that has a vested interest in the product that needs to be delivered. The product owner also understands the end vision of what needs to be delivered. So effectively, the product owner has got, uh, has got the, the, is the best place to actually then provide the, the stories to the backlog in terms of the requirements, what requirements needs to go into the backlog. The product owner in our instance is a shared uh, uh, responsibility for the Scrum Master. So effectively, I'm, I am Scrum Master as well as product owner, but therefore, I don't act on my own, own and I engage with the business to ensure that I understand what their end vision is, what they, their requirements is, so that I can actually communicate that to the team. Uh, the Scrum Master is basically the person that will need to guide and coach the team and motivate the team and ensure that the team actually uh, stays aligned to the Agile principles. Uh, one major, majorly important uh, aspect of the Scrum Master is to protect the team. And when I say protect the team, it is to protect the team from distractions. And sometimes from distracting themselves and uh, distracting each other or being distracted by business uh, just going directly to a developer and asking them to do things. So effectively, the Scrum Master uh, protects the team and makes sure that the team stays focused throughout the entire process. And then of course you have the development team in members. Uh, in MediClinic, uh, because of the approach that we are taking, uh, you will see that you know, our development team uh, is required to have also very strong analytical capabilities in terms of being able to uh, engage with business and talk with business. Uh, effectively, that is the roles that's involved. The ceremonies that happens throughout the entire process, and it starts off with the sprint planning uh, and sprint refinement, uh, then goes into the sprint execution with the daily scrums, which happens on a daily basis. And then uh, in the end, uh, we have a sprint review, which is a demonstration of, of what was delivered to the business. And 
to end of the sprint, we actually have a sprint retrospective. And the sprint retrospective is used to actually uh, understand what, where, where did we do, we do well during the, the sprint and also to understand what we need to improve on. In terms of the art artifacts of the, uh, of the entire uh, framework, you will see that we've got a sprint backlog. Uh, uh, we've got the, the product backlog, we've got the sprint backlog, and then of course, what we deliver in the end would be, uh, would be a minimal viable product. It is important to, to note that our, we aim to deliver at least in, within a sprint, uh, some uh, piece of a product. And we aim to at least within a sprint, do a, dem a demonstration of that product to the business. Uh, so when we are de delivering a minimal viable product, we must understand that that software is intended to be useful to business. So effectively, it is quite challenging because some developments might take much longer in order to do. Uh, but throughout the team, there will always be something being delivered uh, during a sprint. And also at some point in time during a sprint, we will do a demonstration to business. It is very important because if you don't keep, uh, you know, do those demonstrations to business, then effectively um, you don't show the progress to business and you, you basically lose the communication with business. So we start off on a Monday, on a, on a Friday before we start a sprint with our sprint planning session. Uh, the sprint planning uh, takes the stories from the backlog as well as any uh, output from sprint retrospectives as well as sprint reviews. Uh, and we formulate a sprint plan, which then is uh, refined on a Monday morning by the, development, the developers by adding in their subtasks to deliver each of the, of the different stories. So effectively, we add in the stories in the sprint planning session. We uh, understand what can be delivered in that session, in the, that sprint. And then of course, on the Monday morning, the developers will come in to uh, say which subtasks are required in order to deliver those stories and then do the estimations on that. Uh, then we start the sprint uh, on that Monday morning. We go through our daily scrums throughout the two week sprint that we are uh, implementing. And the aim is to deliver the, a, a product. Somewhere in the, 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 the sprint, we will do the demonstration to business um, and any feedback out of the demonstration to business or during the sprint review will feed back into the product backlog as uh, additional changes. And then ultimately we will also have our sprint retrospective. So that's overall just the, the generic process. Uh, and we have the sprint retrospectives normally on a Friday, uh, just before we do have the sprint planning session uh, that's for the next sprint. Okay, any questions on this? Um, sure. Hi, Ernest, I actually have a question. Um, I heard you talk about your product backlog and your spring backlog. So now I want to know what happens if you said something on the product backlog that um, you want to do this at maybe spring one or spring two, mm -hmm. and then you when it's that it's a time to actually do that on that sprint, you can't actually do it. What happens? Do you delete those stories and yeah, what actually happens if it can't be completed? So, so you, you must remember that um, your product backlog is a living uh, log of all the stories or requirements that comes from business. So effectively, if you, if you have multiple sprints open at the same time, so what we, we normally do is we have the active sprint and all the stories that is contained or that we plan to deliver for that sprint is within that sprint. And then we have an inactive sprint, which is the next sprint. And if we cannot deliver something in this current sprint, what will, have to, what will happen is that we will either allow that story to overflow to the next sprint, or alternatively, um, we will um, 
end of that, uh, that story, meaning if, for instance, uh, five of the six tasks, subtasks within that story have been completed, we will end that uh, story and create a new story into the new sprint. But it's very seldom that we will delete stories out of the backlog. The reason for that is that in the end, the stories in the backlog is actually the requirements that comes from business. So very seldom that we will delete something. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so let's delve a bit into the sprint planning. Um, what we quickly realized was that, you know, when you start doing sprint planning and you just look at sprints, uh, you lose the uh, ability that you have with the waterfall approach to actually give visibility in terms of timelines and, and of delivery. So what we um, developed was a demand pipeline. On the one side, the demand pipeline is normally the agreed objectives that what we need to deliver for the year for the business. Um, those are prioritized by the business and through engagement with the business. Uh, we also allocate uh, the, the from our three team, team members, the, uh, the, you know, each team member to uh, uh, one of the objectives based on their area of expertise and the experience. Uh, so effectively in the end, we ensure that the demand pipeline gets maintained at least once a month and we know exactly what is contained within that. If there is of course new requirements that comes in from business, uh, then we will add that to the demand pipeline in order to maintain visibility of any new demand that might come up. In combination with the demand pipeline, we then also have a high level plan. Uh, the high level plan basically gives the, uh, a, a waterfall approach and a, or waterfall view to the uh, delivery of functionality to the business across the various sprints. So if you look at, for instance, uh, over here, uh, let me just bring in the mouse, you will see that uh, that over there is one sprint and there is another sprint. So we clearly highlight the sprints and we also uh, through that give the business some indication in terms of when things will be delivered. Of course, both the demand pipeline and the high level plan at any point in time can be impacted by incidents or service requests especially if we have a major, major incident that requires immediate attention and all hands on deck. So therefore, um, if there is any changes to the high level plan or the demand pipeline, we basically have to engage with business and talk to them and, uh, to make sure that they understand the implications thereof. Uh, those, the demand pipeline and the high level plan both actually feeds into the sprint plan. Uh, so when we are doing sprint planning, even before the, we have the sprint planning session, what we normally do is I sit down and I basically start creating the sprint. And using uh, uh, feedback that we got from the, 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 the demo to the business, uh, any overflow that I am aware of from a previous sprint, any agile events, uh, planned meetings, uh, any uh, Thing that will consume anybody's uh, time are added to that sprint. So therefore you will see that we we've even add a story in for peer review and support uh, so that effectively even that can be monitored and we understand exactly how much time we devote to that. Uh, also sometimes our sprint plan can be impacted by people being on leave and uh, having training and so on. So effectively that is taken into consideration. And then a, a last thing that we, we need to think about is also that not all resources will have the same ability to, to deliver the same amount of story points within a sprint. So sometimes it's just good to take that also into consideration. Uh, so effectively before we go into the sprint planning meeting, I already have a draft sprint plan. And as we go into the sprint planning meeting, then I sit down with each one of the developers and we go through 
and we, we, we commit to what we can deliver within that sprint. Of course, uh, there are so, always some, some uh, unknowns in any de development and operational support environment. Uh, and that's why we, we use the 80-20 principle of only planning, planning 80% of a resources time. Uh, we also started um, because we know for any new delivery, you have to go through the same process. So effectively what we did was to take the process flow of delivering of a new solution and all the, 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 the steps that we, from a technical perspective, need to go through and we documented that into a, um, a spreadsheet uh, that actually then categorized the things into stories and then subtasks. So effectively, when we are doing a delivery, we can have a template to say, these are the stories for any new de de um, delivery that you need to actually go through and the subtasks that relates to these stories in order to deliver any new uh, um, solution. And that is normally a vanilla solution uh, concept. Now, what we've developed there was to create that spreadsheet and basically by allowing you to select uh, certain of the stories and the subtasks, you can then generate the CSV that, you, that we then import into JIRA. It's uh, very useful, especially if you have uh, repeating stories, you will see there, for instance, I've got here, um, and it's very small, sorry for that. But uh, for instance, admin and meetings, uh, all the if, sprint events is documented there. So they are listed as subtasks and those subtasks are allocated to each one of the different resources. So that allows us then to have this template uh, that we can use for story creation and uh, subtask creation. Uh, and it becomes very re reusable in the end. Okay, any questions with regards to sprint planning? Yeah, Ernest, I think there's, there are a few. Mm -hmm. um, so Carl van der uh, asked the question, the, and, the, and maybe it's just a comment, but he said, safe calls your high level plan a release train. So I suppose that's just a mapping. Um, the next one is from Henry. He says, how often is the pipeline priorities um, defined? Uh, is it a formal meeting with all business stakeholders? Henry, if I got that right, I think there may be a word missing. So, yeah, so, so effectively the demand pipeline um, is mostly ma maintained by myself um, because I engage with the, the various stakeholders. Um, it is basically a negotiation and the reason why I'm saying it's basically a negotiation is because we cannot, with three developers uh, and the amount of solutions that we have and the, the demand that's coming in, we cannot satisfy everybody every time. So sometimes we have to say to HR, um, if it's fine with you, we are currently de delivering this for uh, the enterprise reference structures. And uh, once we complete it with that, we can only start within the next sprint uh, to work on your requirement. Uh, because we have that relationship now with business, it's quite easy. And uh, I mean, I think it's very seldom now that we have clashes between functions where one function demands something that um, is impacting another function. And even if we do have that, then we will go through a negotiation process with them. But like I say, we try to update it on a monthly basis and keep it up to date. But uh, yeah, it is uh, because we engage so, so much with our business, especially because you have the demo sessions that you really get uh, quite good feedback and uh, rapport with the business in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? So effectively sprint planning um, is quite important. And what I can stress is if possible, try to think uh, one or two sprints ahead um, 
it is only you you cannot be just focusing on the the current sprint you need to think about sprints ahead and especially in terms of your resource uh, uh, capabilities and what what needs to happen there uh, in terms of sprint execution and stand up so what one thing that i can say to you that is the most important thing is that the stand ups must happen and you don't ever skip a stand up not for any reason the only only agreed reason that we have for stand ups not occurring is for instance when we do a sprint, a sprint planning and retrospective that morning we don't do a, a, a stand up but it is because we will be going into the sprint planning and completing everything. But the rest of the time we have a standup. If the scrum master is not there, one of the team members goes ahead and still facilitates the standup. So stick to the rhythm. Don't ever skip. Once you start skipping, it becomes easier to skip another meeting and another meeting before you know it. You might have one stand-up in, in, in a week, and before you know it, your entire Agile uh, approach uh, is basically in tatters. Uh, the other thing is, you know, in the stand-up, normally it is expected of each uh, developer to uh, state what they are currently busy with, uh, what they've completed the previous day, and uh, what uh, they will be working on today as well as having any impediments, meaning what issues or challenges they have that's prohibiting them from actually progressing. Now, it can become very monotonous if, if those are the only things that you discuss in a, a stand-up. Yes, you will have a stand-up stand uh, that's very short and focused, but effectively you will lose your team in the end. Uh, therefore, we allow uh, valuable interaction. You know, if, for instance, a, one of the developers uh, asks a question, I allow the conversation to continue, and, but still keep it short and focused. The reason for that is if you don't maintain that val valuable interaction, it just becomes just a tick in a box exercise. And that's the last thing that you want, would like to happen to any meeting. A meeting must have a purpose and the me meeting must have a value. And if it's, if it's not valuable to, to the people attending, then in the end, you will lose them. So it's very important to, to keep that, the meeting as a valuable interaction opportunity. Also reprioritize. So if for instance, we have uh, incidents or service requests coming in, we might have to say to, uh, to one of the developers, this is an important uh, um, incident. First stop, what you're currently working on, complete this, fix this, get this back in, into production before continuing. Or, you know, uh, first uh, uh, address the service request from business before continuing with, with what you are doing now. It is important because if you don't reprioritize, if you don't allow that level of flexibility, then in the end, you will have the business standing at your door the whole time going, but we've got these incidents, they, they never get resolved, or we've requested this and we don't get any um, uh, you know, love and attention from you. So effectively, it's all about understanding what is important for the business, um, having the communication with the business, and sometimes just asking the business, can this wait for another two days, especially if it's a service request? Um, if they say yes, then you know at least it gives you time to actually focus on on what you need to need to focus on. You also need to understand what possible overflow there could be within a sprint. I know that within the Agile framework, um, it's about committing, and the entire team commits to to completing a, a certain set of work within a sprint. But having a DevOps environment, it's not always possible. So therefore, we keep a, 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 an eye on any stories that might have to overflow into the next sprint. Also, sometimes uh, because of business availability, I mean, let's take it for instance, how many times does it happen to you that you schedule testing session with a business, uh, a UAT testing session, 
and then something comes up from a business perspective and that UAT session cannot happen. So effectively, you must be flexible enough to allow for possible overflow into, a net, into the next sprint. And we do allow for that, but it is about the entire team acknowledging it and the entire team subscribing to it and understanding what the implications there are. Uh, one thing that we've implemented, especially now that the entire team is working from home, is to have additional optional uh, uh, catch-up sessions. Um, for instance, if the stand-up is in the morning, then we will have a catch-up session at 12 and then another one at 4. These sessions are optional, meaning that if I have another meeting that I need to attend, then I won't be at the catch-up catch session. But it is valuable sessions and we don't really have an agenda for those sessions. We allow the team to actually engage with each other because many a times there's just something that uh, somebody wants to clarify or quickly uh, you know, uh, just bounce off somebody else. So it's important to actually give that opportunity for the team to engage with each other. Um, and that's why we, we keep it at very short. It's a 15 minute session, but at least it gives that opportunity for the team to engage and, and sometimes even just talk about the weather if it need, needs to, but at least give them that time to bond again as a team. Uh, some of the things that we see, we've seen is that, you know, if you start delivering and you deliver cons consistently and you deliver according to what you promise, and that is what Agile enables you to do, um, effectively, you, you will not believe the compounding effect of the success that, that you get from that. The engagement of, uh, with business just becomes a pleasure. It's so much better. They understand your way of working. They, um, they subscribe to it in the end. Uh, and I must say, even the most difficult teams, uh, the business teams were able to, to, to come around. And the reason for that is just the fact that you are delivering and you are delivering according to what, what you promise. Uh, but the, 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 the flip side of that coin is that it stimulates the business. And before you know it, you've got additional requirements uh, coming to you. Of course, that is not bad. It is actually great because it gives your team a, a reason for existence. I always say that if you lose your reason for existence, then in the end, uh, there's no reason for you to be in the company anymore. And effectively, I think that is what we as uh, data management solutions needs to realize or uh, data management practitioners needs to realize is that in the end, delivering that success, those solutions that uh, provides value to the business is so important uh, to them. And that's why we, we allow for um, bespoke solutions to be delivered, even though it's not master data management, but it's data management. And we do deliver those solutions for the business. Uh, one thing that you need to be cautious of is to have too many things in progress. Of course, one of the principles of, of Agile is that is, is to, have, to be focused. And you will quickly see that, you know, if a resource is not focused uh, in terms of delivering one, one thing, one story at, at a time, and they have five stories that's all in progress, you will see very slow progress in terms of each one of those stories. So it's always good to, to actually try and force uh, and not force, but uh, basically coach your team to, to basically uh, monitor the, the number of things that they have in progress. Uh, I think, you know, there's some studies done in terms of when people need to switch between one task to another task, uh, how long it will take them to actually switch between the two. And I think especially when it is a developer that's working with code, it even takes longer. So, in, in terms of time loss, you know, if you've got five different stories and you lose uh, uh, 15 minutes with each uh, switching between each one of them, you can think how much time during the day you end up losing. So try and minimize the, the, the amount of stories that's all in progress at the same time. 
Then the last one that you see there, time, time box unknowns. Um, many a times in, uh, especially at a development and uh, operational support environment, you get a request to, to deliver something, but effectively you need to do some research. You don't know whether it's possible or not. You need to do some investigation. You need to try out um, something. Those unknowns can take up a huge amount of time. And, you know, uh, it, it creates basically a, a, to a tornado effect. It, you know, consumes every, anything in its pathway. And before you know it, it has consumed half of your sprint. So we focus on getting uh, time boxing those things. So effectively, a developer will say, I will only dedicate four hours to this, and that's it. If I, if I get to the end of the four hours and I'm not none the wiser, then we will have to replan that into the next sprint. But you have to do that time boxing of those unknowns. If you don't do it, uh, there is a major impact in terms of your sprint delivery um, and your ability to, to deliver according to your promises. Any questions in terms of the sprint executions, stand-ups? Nothing. Yeah, Ernest, maybe uh, I, mm -hmm. I have one and, and happy if you put it to the end, but mm -hmm. what, what I'm, I'm interested in is due to your limited development team um, mm -hmm. and you are in operational support, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm trying to draw a connection here with data management specifically in terms of getting your data stewards involved in, in some of that, so those support issues. Uh, are you seeing some of that crossover? Uh, how, how is that playing in the data management uh, team or structure? So effectively, um, sometimes uh, even the, the development team needs to get involved um, because there might be some requests coming from the data stewards in terms of, you know, request for um, extracts out of the, the system or um, doing bulk updates and so on. So effectively, um, you know, whenever there's data issues, um, it is basically a, a business responsibility to get resolved. Uh, those are normally not logged as incidents to us, but it can look like an incident and therefore sometimes will be logged to us. Uh, but effectively, we work then with the data steward to, to rectify the issue if it need be then we will do bulk updates or changes, but we will not do it uh, without having proof that it was requested from that specific uh, data steward. So it's, it is a balancing act, um, especially with a very small team. Uh, but I think, you know, up till now, we've been able to, to handle it quite well. I do know that, you know, uh, at some point in time, you know, we're going to have run into capacity issues with regards to the team, especially if you look at the number of solutions that we have. Uh, and maybe I, I should not advertise at this point in time, but we are looking to, to, to increase the size of our team. So I'll just keep quiet there. Okay. Uh, any other questions or any other CVs? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, in terms of sprint reviews and retrospectives, um, one thing that we've seen, especially with the sprint reviews where you demonstrate the solution to the business is that, you know, it will be the first time that, that the business actually sees the solution. So effectively, you don't want to give a, or do a, a demonstration to the business with a solution that's full of uh, problems and issues and, you know, uh, you know, that's totally, you know, gets stuck or, you know, falls over and those type of things. So effectively, you want to have a solution that is quite uh, error free that you're going to de demonstrate to the business. But also, in order to ensure that, so what we've done is that even before we do a demonstration to the business, one of the things that we do is we do a peer demonstration. So within the team to demonstrate the solution. It actually helps quite a lot because um, things that uh, the developer themselves might not have picked up can then be noticed by the team. Um, 
And also sometimes we get very good input in terms of, you know, have you tried this? Can you, you can think of maybe doing it this way and so on. So effectively the, the input from the team actually allows us to make sure that before we go to the business and before we show it to the business that it is a working solution. Um, also the, the fact that because you are demonstrating it to the rest of the team, there is awareness of that solution and everybody does have an understanding of what the solution actually entails. One thing that I didn't mention earlier, you know, in terms of peer reviews and so on, um, you know, we, we also have peer uh, design reviews that we do. So it sounds, you know, how do you do all of these things at the same, you know, within a sprint? It's not all done in one sprint. It's done over, you know, sometimes uh, over a few sprints, but effectively we aim to always do those, uh, those um, activities, which in the end ensures that what we are delivering is of quality. So when we do the demonstration to the business, we want to make sure that the solution is uh, working and uh, functioning correctly. Uh, the main thing is it creates that first trust and confidence of the business uh, to the solution that we are providing to them. Um, also, you know, because they are not fully involved in our agile um, process, and this is one of the few touch points that we have with them, it creates that sense of partnering because effectively when you demonstrate it to them, they start realizing that, you know, this is a journey that you go through. And we tell them, you know, this is now uh, based on your requirement that you've specified to us, this is what we've built up till now. What do you think about it? Does it actually align to your expectations? And it then creates that sense of, you know, it's not something that's done to them, it's done, something that, that's done with them. And, the, they are becoming partners in this entire delivery and slowly but surely they, they they become involved also you know it creates that familiarity of the solution sorry for that uh, so that when we do training and uat and even eventually have to uh, deploy the solution to production that they are all already familiar with the solution They've seen the solution now two, three, four times maybe before we actually go to um, deploy the, the solution to production. Um, it, the, the UAT sessions just becomes a breeze because effectively they already have a sense of what roles, what the process, the processes, uh, workflow processes are, uh, you know, in terms of what the screens looks like, and they've already given their feedback in terms of the screens. So the UAT sessions becomes uh, much better and much easier to actually conduct. But I think the most important thing is it creates, uh, as a, for, gives us an opportunity for course correction. Um, I always say, you know, if you want to travel from Spain to South Africa, you don't just uh, say that you want to travel in a, a southern direction, get into a ship, and once you hit land, you disable the ship and then move, move across land until you hit the sea again, and then just continue south in that same direction. And the same, and that was very much what we did in a waterfall approach. The with uh, agile, at least you know, we show the solution to the business, we get their feedback. Uh, we apply the changes, we change our course, uh, show it to get again to them, and so we continue. So effectively, in the end, we do get to the, to the uh, destination that is most desirable to the business and not, um, you know, our impression of what it should be. Um, so I cannot stress more that, you know, the more you engage with your business and the, the earlier you can show them a solution, um, even if it's the, just the first portion of the solution, but get something to them as soon as possible, uh, because the value that you get out of that and the feedback that you get out of that is so much better. That progress that you're showing, it's not a situation that you're going away for three months and then three months later you go, ta-da, there's the solution. Those days are just, you know, or that that way of working is just ineffective. We we believe in rather failing earlier than 
you know, fa failing over the long term. Okay. Any questions with regards to sprint reviews? Nothing. Uh, yes. So Ernest, I was just going to add um, mm -hmm. in one of the things from uh, from my side that I see as a real benefit of this in, in our environment is um, our engagement with the um, data stewards in the different areas. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that this having uh, the MDM process and uh, at MediClinic has helped with is identifying those people who are the data stewards who actually um, manage the data in the different areas. And I think because of this process, we've been able to build better relationships with them in terms of that delivery pipeline that Ernest mentioned. And, um, you know, they're able to, when they have requirements, um, you know, whether it be a, a system change or a data change, and we need to get involved, we're able to, that we've built a relationship with them where they can actually say to us, this is urgent, you need to force it into, you know, this sprint, no matter what, or actually, this is something that can wait a week or two weeks until your next sprint, so we can, we can get it in there. So that, I think, has been one of the key things that we've seen. I mean, when we started on this process, as I said, about two years ago, th that every, every request that came in was urgent and needed to be handled right away because that was the expectation from business. And managing, you know, managing our business um, relationship using this, we've been able to better help them to actually come to us and say, oh, we know you're in the middle of a sprint. Um, so whatever this request is, uh, whether it's a data request that's, that's needing changed or um, some, some new aspect to the solution, uh, maybe it be a new data governance workflow that we need to build in for them. We can wait a sprint or two sprints for this um, because we know you're working on some other, other um, priorities. So I think, Ernest, for me, that's been one of the things that's, you know, and I think that's come out of our, our retrospective and our sprint reviews is that, you know, that relationship with business is something that has evolved as well over time. And I, I think, Craig, what I would also add there is that it was quite interesting. We did not train the business in terms of the agile um, uh, framework and uh, the process that we are following. It's very interesting how, you know, within a few sprints, this, the business started using the, the terms of, you know, you know, are you in the middle of your sprint? When is your next, next sprint starting? You know, um, can we actually have the demonstration of this? By when will we have it? And so on. So it's quite interesting how the business then starts evolving and start engaging with you in terms of that. I think, uh, you know, in terms of retrospectives, which happens at the end of the sprint, uh, I think, you know, I've heard some, some companies or some horror stories about retrospectives in other companies and especially with regards to Agile. And I think retrospectives could be the, the, the death of Agile in any company, especially um, if it's not hand, handled correctly. So some of the key things that we've seen with uh, retrospectives is that as a team, we need to focus on our success. Um, it is so important that we celebrate the success that we've, we've achieved and you know, the progress that we've made as a team. And even you know, if there's an individual that did something great during that, that uh, uh, sprint, it is you know, the, the prime opportunity to actually highlight that. But retrospectives needs to be a safe space. And, you know, there should not be any finger point pointing in a retrospective and there should not be complaints because it can easily totally, uh, you know, get into a, a blame situation where one person then blames another and, you know, in the end, emotions just goes rife. So it is very important for the, the, the person that's leading the retrospective to manage the conversation and to manage um, what is being said and how it is being perceived. So, and when I'm saying manage conversations, I'm also talking about managing emotions. Uh, we've had some very, very tough 
um, retrospectives where emotions started to flare. And if you don't manage it, it will totally erupt, in, especially in a retrospective. So it is important that whoever is basically uh, leading the retrospective not only manages the, the, the emotions of the team members sitting there, but also their own emo emotions. Um, because it is counterproductive and it will totally destroy the team. And the reason why I'm talking about this is that what we don't realize is that within Agile, everything is about the team. It's about creating that sense of team. It's making sure that the team understands that it is either the team that's succeeding or the team that is failing. And in the end, by blaming each other and by finger pointing and so on is just counterproductive and it will destroy the team. So it's so it's so important to handle retrospectives very sensitively with very big um, sensitivity. And therefore, I think the, the most important thing is to focus on the actions. So if there are things that's wrong, uh, it is better to focus on how and what steps are we going to take in order to improve uh, than to focus on you know who is to blame. And I think that's that's been one of our um, secrets to success is that we focused on the actions and included those actions uh, into our uh, follow follow up sprints and into our ways of working. Um, it is so important that you you stick to that and make sure that you are action driven in terms of getting things resolved instead of uh, blame driven in order to identify who was, who was the culprit. Any questions? Yeah, um, Ernest, are you, I'm, I'm assuming that these interruptions um, and delays, um, as you say, they may push certain elements into the next sprint, which mm -hmm. may mean that you, you miss the minimal viable product. But mm -hmm. I suppose that's not my core question. My core question is, um, are you doing a lot of analytics on from a data point of view in terms of those disruptions to be able to feed back into the next the next sprint or the adjustment of your actions and, and things like that? Uh, so effectively in the retrospective, um, what will happen is for instance, somebody will say, but uh, you know, um, unfortunately due to um, all the, 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 the incidents that I had and the surge requests that I had during the sprint, I could not achieve my sprint goal, okay? Um, so effectively then the question is, all right, all these uh, issues that came about, you know, what was the cause of that? And maybe what actions do we need to take in order to minimize that? So effectively the, the idea is to get to the action in terms of, what do we need to do in order to ensure that we don't have as much overflow or so many inter interruptions into the next sprint? Sometimes, you know, if for instance it is end of year um, and uh, you know there's company planning and those type of things happening, then you will get quite a lot of interruptions in terms of requests for information or changes and so on. But effectively, we do understand that. Um, and then we can say, all right, we understand this is the time of year, so therefore there is an impact in terms of our capacity. But if it is something that directly relates to a problem within our solutions, then effectively that becomes a story for the next uh, sprint that we need to attack, uh, address. Does it answer your question? Um... Yeah, I suppose not entirely. I, I, mm -hmm. I would assume that the the things that, that delayed somebody didn't mm -hmm. happen almost in the last day. So they should have been mm -hmm. raised in your stand-ups and you should have yes. to an extent you, you would be aware of it. So yes. it's almost a you know a recognition that you've had these challenges, but the mm -hmm. constant analysis of the interruptions and that should be should be almost predicting or forecasting that you're gonna miss it anyway. Um, yeah, and, and that's why I said, you know, in the stand-ups, we, we keep an, an eye in terms of the possible yeah. overflow, which can result because of, you know, operational support um, issues that have been raised. 
Ja. Okay. Okay. I think lastly, some just some general things that that we've learned. Um, I think the main thing that that, we, that I can say is um, all thanks to the, to the team that I have because I think the the, the three developers that I have actually now four uh, busy with a handover between two developers. Um, the four developers that I have uh, all have in the skills to engage with business. Um, the days of just being a developer and sitting in the corner and just writing code, I think um, th those days are pretty much gone. Uh, and I call them an analyst de developers, meaning that they are able to engage with business. They are able to listen to business, understand the business requirements, because effectively, if you are in a demo session with a business, you need to be able to, to listen and be able to understand what business is actually saying to you. Um, so therefore, uh, I think it is important that we realize that developers um, just having the skills of, you know, writing code is good to a certain extent, but in an agile environment, I think it becomes much more important that your developers have analytical skills. Um, majorly important is to have efficient and streamlined processes. And this is with regards to incident management, change management, deployment, peer reviews, uh, you name it. Everything that touches on in terms of your de development and operations, you need to have very good processes. And it is very good to, within the retrospectives, to also look at those processes and, and ask the question, you know, is our co code versioning process working? Um, I mean, for instance, we had uh, a, quite a, a, a big change with regards to our code versioning, just because of that question being asked in a, in a retrospective, um, which then in the end led to the streamlining of that. So effectively, um, you need to look at your processes and make sure that they are optimal in terms of um, enabling your team to be efficient. Uh, I did speak about the peer reviews. Uh, like I said, um, you know, we have a peer review in terms of design. We have a peer review in terms of code. Uh, that is whenever we, we need to deploy uh, code between say for instance, development and QA, um, there is a review of that code being done. And then also we have a review in, uh, of the solution before it is uh, of the demonstration. All of that feeds back into ensuring the quality of the solution. Um, you know, somebody once said to me, there's always, uh, um, there's never time and money to do it the first time right. There's always time and money to come and fix it. Um, and unfortunately, it is just counterproductive. So effectively, if we can do it first time right, so much better. And that's where the peer reviews um, is so, why it's so important. But also the support, I, I must say again uh, to the team, excellent. Uh, we've had situations where one developer's laptop would crash and then it's basically everybody that can help jump, jumps in and support that person to get back online and working again. It's so important that, you know, a team member never feels like they are left, um, you know, for the sharks and, don't don't have any support and help, especially your inexperienced developers. So it's very good to have that sense of teamship and you know all hands on deck approach. That if something goes wrong, that anybody is willing to help and make sure that it gets resolved. Of course, like I said, if the team fails, then uh, you know it's not about the individual failures; it's about the team failing. And I'd rather have the, the entire team uh, ensure that we as a team in the end uh, reach a certain goal than to have only a certain person in the team re reaching a certain goal. So, so much important, uh, so, so, so much importance um, you have to put on place on the team and the support that team members actually give to, to one, one another. Uh, and then the last one is, uh, you know, for me, Scrum masters can sit on the side and give instructions and, you know, 
in the end run four, five, six different scrums and, you know, think that in the end, you know, the development team can do it by themselves and so on. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, so important that the scrum master realizes that they are part of that team and, you know, needs to be involved sometimes in the detail, needs to be involved in all the discussions, needs to be available to support wherever needed. Um, if you have a on hands uh, uh, scrum master, the team appreciates it and the team also gets that sense that they do have the, their backs covered um, by the, the scrum master because you know, effectively, like I said earlier, the, the scrum master needs to protect the team. Uh, in terms of delivery of new solutions, one thing that we've realized is, you know, when I started uh, at MediClinic three years ago, one of my first instructions was, uh, I want to, uh, um, I need to pr produce a template for uh, business requirements uh, for solutions. Of course, I went away and um, came back with a document that was many pages thick and, and so on, templates and so on. But quickly realized that, you know, even if you complete that template, very few people actually read through it, number one. And number two, really, really understands what's being said in the template. Over time, we've actually started honing down that template to, uh, to the bare uh, necessities uh, in terms of what we need in order to deliver a solution. And I think, you know, at this point in time, you know, Having that understanding of what we need in order to deliver a solution, understanding the business rules, understanding the workflows, understanding the roles, um, those are the things that are that, it, that is important. And uh, having the fluff in the in in a in a business requirements document, you know, is good. But in the end, it uh, you will have very few people actually giving attention to it. So we try to focus on the bare necessities. It saves us time. It makes us more efficient. Uh, like I said earlier, the minimal viable product, getting something to the business as soon as, soon as possible is imperative. Um, you, you need to ensure that it is shippable, meaning that it doesn't have major issues in it um, and that the business actually gains confidence in that solution as, uh, as early as possible. Uh, well, like I also said earlier, having the agility, you know, you need to have the agility sometimes even to substitute stories in a sprint. And we had situations where we knew that in the, in the beginning of a sprint, there's no way that business will be available to actually um, contribute to a specific story. And we had to then swap out that story with another story, which is fine. Um, I think, you know, Again, people will say, but that's against agile principles. I do, do understand that, but that's not reality. So for me, the re reality that things will change on the ground from a day-to-day -day basis, you need to take into consideration. But in the end, you need to focus on the bigger picture, not only in terms of uh, what you are delivering with regards to that specific solution, but also understanding that you know all the solutions that you are delivering in some way at some point in time will create a synergy effect between each other. Like for instance, we have our enterprise reporting structure solution and now our identity access management solution. And these solutions now starts becoming pivotal to all other solutions. Um, so effectively you start realizing that things that you did two years ago is now starting to add value to other solutions that you are currently building. And you need to be able to step back and see that bigger picture and how solutions can complement each other. And that is it from our side. Any questions? Yeah, so we do have one from Charles. Um, mm -hmm. Have you seen an increase in the team's velocity with the developers being in essence a BA and having the direct contact with the customer? I think it's it's much better, um, especially you know we, when we had the solution situation where, for instance, I go away, I understand the requirement, and I come back. Then I still have to explain that same requirement to the you know, to the developer, and you know. 
in the end, you know, the back and forth and so on, it's, it's not good. Having the developer um, being part of the analysis process, being part of the actual demonstrations and so on, uh, that engagement really helps. I think you know we can maybe ask Craig if he th thinks he's more more pr productive and uh, this way. But I do think, from my perspective, uh, I see much better improvement in terms of that. Yeah, Ernest, I think um, it it definitely helps. Um, you know, as having that dual role of developer and um, and business analyst and that direct link to, to your business uh, customers um, definitely helps makes, makes things go faster. Um, you know, if you have a question, um, instead of having to go to a BA who then has to go to the customer, you can actually ask the questions yourself. And even with some of the, um, you, know, you, you, you spoke about the demos to business, you know, while we do have sort of the formal um, review sessions, it's, it's so easy to just quickly take your laptop, show, go show business, um, you know, some of the, the screens, what you're thinking, get their immediate feedback um, and, um, you know, be able to make those changes, you know, quickly. Um, then having to go through um, uh, an additional player in the process. So I definitely think it's helped our, uh, us to deliver quicker to business. Mm. Also, I think maybe it's just a, another area that, that we sometimes overlook is that in the end, the developer is basically creating something, okay, mm -hmm. from scratch. And, you know, there's a certain level of pride that goes into what they deliver. And many times, you know, when you have, when you hand that over to a business analyst to go and dem demonstrate it to the business and then get the feedback from the business, uh, that feedback to the, from the business, especially if the business is very impressed with the solution. I'm, I can tell you now, um, there was so many, were so many sessions that we sat, sat in where the business goes, wow, this is exactly what we wanted. And then you see the developer actually blooming because they get, they get the direct um, uh, feedback from the business and the compliment directly from the business. It is not secondhand, it is directly to them. And I think for the morale of the team, that's also very good. So we have, we have another question from Andrea um, and she was asking about the involvement of the involvement of a data architect on the team. So, and I suppose whether it's data architect, data modeler, it depends on, on how much of that data design, data analysis work you're doing as to the involvement of that role in your team. Yeah, so, so effectively we did have a data architect, but he was mostly focused on data warehouse area. Um, so effectively um, between Craig and myself, we, we do the, the data architecture um, and modeling um, we need it. Uh, and that's why when we're doing the, the design sessions, it's, it's best to then do the review between us um, and the team member that's that's actually been providing it. Of course, um, you know, uh, it is not optimal, but in the end, you know, uh, I think uh, it's, it's still, you know, better than not having any review at all or any oversight in terms of architecture, data architecture. So may maybe a question for Craig. Craig, um, you've been through the Steve Herberman data modeling course and, yeah. and um, there's, a, there's a strong emphasis on business rules. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys are, are using that in, in some form of agile mode to confirm those rules and, and to ensure that your requirements are, are clear? Yeah, so I think the, that peer review, um, you know, we, we do a design review um, as well as then a peer review on the code. And at both of those points, you're almost, you're able to do that stop and check on the, uh, on the data model to see, okay, what are the, you know, when you were working with business, you obviously got some rules out. Are those rules applicable, uh, you know, in your data model? Have, have you taken those into account? And very often that, that design um, step is where we pick those up, uh, Howard. 
So, you know, immediately you can look if someone's done a design and, and you can look at the model, you can start to ask questions. Um, you know, if, if I think back to, to Steve's example of the accounts, you know, um, can a customer have more than one account? Can yeah. an account be owned by more than one customer? Those are very basic questions that um, looking at, at a model, you can very quickly pick up. And, um, you know, that, that design session, often what happens in our team is the developer will go and do the initial design, they'll bring it in, and then, uh, you know, between Ernest and myself and the developer, we'll do the refinement. And that's definitely where we, where we see that data modeling. Uh, and Ernest um, has also um, had, had exposure to that. And that's definitely where it's, uh, it helps, is you're able to pick those things up a lot more quicker, having just that, that data modeling background um, to, uh, you know, just some of that thinking that comes through from, from the course. Yeah. And I mean, that's some of the, the challenges we have with uh, interacting with business analysts and especially as part of the process you talk about an efficient process you know one of the things we always battle with is is mm -hmm. trying to because we want single touches with a with a business we we don't want too many different stories and too many different questions so um now well in the past in waterfall you'll probably have business analyst data modeler and developer all having those interactions with the business Whereas if we now call them an analyst developer, we've got one touch uh, and, and one communication of the rules or, or formalization and definition yeah. of those rules. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it does okay. help. Um, Remember, sorry, Martin, uh, sorry, yeah, go for it, now, I think uh, also what you need to realize is that the developer doesn't do, the, do it all just by themselves, uh, unless it's, it's a developer like Craig, where I can just let him go. But, right. <laughs> but effectively, um, you know, I normally attend all the sessions with the business also, so that I also understand the requirement. Uh -huh. um, and effectively, you know, when we do the, the design reviews, then, then I can ask the questions and so on. So it, it, it creates that, that dual, um, uh, how can I say, uh, checking from both sides to make sure that what we are delivering is according to their requirements. Ernest, thank, thank you very much for your, for your session. We've had lots of good comments in the chat. Thank you very much. Thanks for your feedback. We appreciate right. it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks Enjoy guys. the rest Thanks of the evening. Thanks, 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 Howard. Thank Cheers, guys. Cheers, Cheers. Bye. 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 Cheers. Cheers, Jan. Cheers, Howard. Go well. Cheers, man. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.